Today we're going to introduce the movement of realism in American literature. And generally, they consider that time period to be right after the American Civil War in 1865 to the start of World War I in 1914. So when we look at American literature as a whole, there are several different literary movements. So as you can see, starting from the Puritan era all the way up to the uh, contemporary and postmodern period, where we're looking at realism from about 1865 to 1914, 1915, the start of World War I, we're actually moving towards our more contemporary time period here. So we need to start off with a little bit of context, the American Civil War. We see the nation being divided. We see the North and the South fighting against one another for political ideals. This is going to interrupt our transcendentalist movement where people thought that you should be attaining your own achievements, your own sense of individualism, the highest that a human being could attain. And because we are going back into war and we're fighting one another, uh, the nation is completely divided. Now, during this time period, you're going to see some of the fundamentalisms of realism, but you're still going to see transcendentalism th throughout the war. One of the most important figures you're going to see writing during the war is Walt Whitman. He's a transition writer uh, where he's going to write a lot of poetry. In fact, his type of poetry is going to be put into a book, and he's going to entitle it Leaves of Grass. It is the only book of poetry he's going to write in his lifetime. He's going to rewrite and rewrite and add more poems in almost nine times throughout his entire life. One of the most famous poems that comes from that is O Captain, My Captain, in which he writes shortly after Abraham Lincoln's death about Abraham Lincoln and what he meant to America. So taking a look at the historical context of the realist movement itself, the population of the United States is growing rapidly. Science and industry and transportation are expanding, where we see our American Civil War basically taking over uh, from the Mississippi River out east from the north and south. Our Western society is only just beginning to grow. Pioneerism is going to expand rapidly during the time of the realist movement, and our immigration is also going to expand rapidly. So our literature has to grow as we are growing in population, but no, most new writers were not romantics or transcendentalists. They're bringing in their new realist ideals. Now our frontier is not going to exist after our, our movement to the Civil War. Its legacy is going to change and it impacts realists in its new form. The aftermath of the Civil War also meant that Americans were less certain and less optimistic about their future. Now, the idealism of the Romantics and the philosophy of the Transcendentalists now seems out of date and very irrelevant to readers who have experienced the Civil War. So what is the difference between realism and Romanticism? Well, let's give an example. The trapper was placed on a rude seat which had been made with studied care. His body was placed so as to let the light of the setting sun fall full upon the solemn features. His head was bare, the long thin locks of gray fluttering lightly in the evening breeze. He was most fifty and he looked it. His hair was long and tangled and greasy and you could see his eyes shining through. There weren't no color in his face. It was white, a white to make a body sick. A tree toed white, a fish belly white. As for his clothes, just rags, that's all. So these are two explanations of a trapper, two descriptions of them, but our romantic on the left-hand side is going to make it sound like he is being romanticized. He's this perfect character, uh, this trapper who's placed on a rude seat, and the rude seat had been made with studied care, and the light of the setting sun is falling upon his solemn features. He's glorified, he's solemnized here. But on the right-hand side, we see him for what he really is. He was mostly 50 and he looked it. His hair is long and tangled and greasy. You could see his eyes shining through though. There wasn't any color in face, it was white and white to make a body sick. We're seeing him for what he really is on the right hand side. So we started off with a lot of heavy philosophy and transcendentalism. So as that philosophy starts changing post-Civil War and into the realist movement, we get this sense of American pragmatism where we say that truth is tested by its usefulness, by its practicality. 
Truth has to be an accessible commodity on the surface of things. Otherwise, it's not real. It has to be perceptible to the senses and verifiable through experience. We have to be able to perceive it with our own senses or the philosophy is not real. And then permanent truths exist apart from the material world. The mind of God in Plato's ideal forms do exist, but they exist separate to reality. Now, from these two social changes come two literary movements. So the realism movement does happen between 1865 and 1914, but within its own literary movement, we also get this sense of naturalism. So your one literary movement actually breaks into two. So our realism movement actually begins in France as a literary doctrine calling for the reality and truth in the depiction of ordinary life. Now, it's grounded in the belief that there's an objective reality which can be portrayed with truth and accuracy as a goal. Now, the writer is not going to select facts in accordance with preconceived ideals. They're going to set down their observations impartially and objectively. Of course, since we had transcendentalism and romanticism before with the sense of idealism, the sense of philosophy, and that man can overcome and, and go above and beyond, there is going to be a reaction against romanticism. It was just too uh, idealistic. And so re realism is this reaction against that time period. And the authors seek to portray life as they saw it. They insist that the ordinary and local were just as suitable for the art as the sublime and idealistic would be. And so realism is going to begin in America almost as a sense of local color. Since we've had people pioneering and moving out west, since we have this influx of immigration in the north and the south, and the east is becoming more citified and less rural, you're going to start seeing more local color. People writing about the west from a western standpoint. People writing about the north from a northern standpoint. So the synthesis of romantic plots and realistic description things are going to make this local color. The literature is going to focus on the character's dialect, the character's customs, the topography of the land, other features that are particular to a specific region. So with realism in American literature, the purpose of the writing is to instruct or it's to entertain. Character is key. They are more important than the plot line during realism. Subject matter is drawn from real life experience, hence the ideal of realism. Realists are going to reject symbolism and the romanticizing of subjects. We see a lot of symbolism and romanticizing in the transcendental and romantic movements. All of a sudden the realists say, no more. That is not real life experience. The settings are usually those familiar to the author. We're bringing in the local color and their regions. Plots are emphasized in the norm of a daily experience because you're following along with characters. And certainly where we had idealistic and sublime characters in the romantic movement, here in realism, you're going to see ordinary, everyday characters that you would meet on the street. We take a look at some of the writers from the realist movement. We do have Stephen Crane writing The Red Badge of Courage, which is post-American Civil War. Uh, Willa Cather, who's going to write My Antonia and O Pioneers, where we're going to get more of the feminist kind of point of view. We start looking out west with Bret Hart's Outcast Poker Flats and with Jack London's The Call of the Wild. Kate Chopin is going to bring in the Eastern movement with the idea of a story of an hour. And arguably the most famous writer in the realist movement is going to be Mark Twain, where he's going to give us life on the Mississippi, the adventures of Tom Sawyer, and the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, where we have this sense of pioneering Western towns becoming more civilized as they're set in the Midwest along the Mississippi River. What are the concerns for literature in the realist movement? You have this sense of wanting to be uniform. After all, previously our movements were small because we had fewer writers. The Romantic movement, uh, the previous movements in the American Revolution and the Puritan movements, even the Transcendentalist movement, people wrote pretty much uniform. 
now with the sense of local color and the sense of wanting to write about ordinary characters from that particular type uh, of place, you're going to see a more diverse literary style. So it's a little more complex than it ever has been before. Ambrose Bierce from the Realist Movement, he's going to say the art of depicting nature as it is seen by toads and a story written by a measuring worm. What, what, what does that even mean? Well, when you are concerned by trying to not create literature with the sense of idioms or the sense of figurative language, your similes, your metaphors, your symbolisms are not the most important thing, it becomes a bit more complex to describe. Of course, we're now trying to capture the commonplace, which means your reader has to be able to draw a connection. Commonplace can mean so many different things to so many different local colors. For also writing in the vernacular and the local dialect, somebody who is from that particular region will have a very easy time to understand the dialect. But if you're taking, say, a Western writer such as Ambrose Bierce or Jack London or Bret Hart and try to put them over in the East, the Easterners reading it might not understand the local vernacular, the local dialect. They might not know the local stories or the nature. It has this sense of beauty, but it's going to also wear the human spirit down. And of course, for Twain and other authors, the narrative voice is one of division, where, where we were before and after the war. The idea of what is conventional and uniform versus that personal conviction. Other ideologies that, once again, we're going to see, you see them in every literary movement, but they're going to be taking a different turn in realism, is the sense of God. How is God portrayed in our realist movement? The sense of government. How is government now moving on post-American Civil War? Education. There has been rumblings throughout the transcendentalist movement about an education for all. How is that now formulating for the first time? What is a man's purpose in life? Now that we're looking at less of a class society and more of a sense of an individualist society, what is man's purpose in life? How is the American dream evolving now that we have more immigrants coming in, now that we've got the Western movement now going away from pioneering days and actually civilizing itself? What does the American dream now mean in the realist movement? And of course, there has to be an evidence of influence that we have from our previous movements. One of our more famous authors from this movement is going to be Mark Twain. He was born as Samuel Langhorne Clemens, November 30th, 1835 in Missouri, and he's traveled throughout the United States during his adult life. He spends quite a bit of time in his younger days in California, and in his older days, he actually takes quite a few trips to Europe. Now, much of his writing stemmed from his travel and his boyhood experiences, and he's well known for his sense of humor and his satirical writing style. Mark Twain would then die in 1910. If we look at some of Mark Twain's quotes, we have, a man who carries a cat by the tail learns something he can learn in no other way. And in age is an issue of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. What's a classic? A book with people pra which people praise, but they don't read. Now don't let schooling interfere with your education, and few things are harder to put up with than the annoyance of a good example. When we take a look at Mark Twain's arguably most famous story, Huckleberry Finn, we also see him during the Realist Movement tackling slavery. Now, slavery was abolished with the American Civil War, and now we're taking a look at the Realist Movement coming to terms with the sense of freedom of these newly freed slaves. Now, in those old slaveholding days, the whole community was agreed as to one thing, the sacredness of slave property. To help steal a horse or a cow was a low crime, but to help a hunted slave or hesitate to promptly betray him to the slave catcher was a much baser crime and carried with it a stain, a moral smirch which nothing could wipe away. That the sentiment should exist among slave owners is comprehensible. There is a good commercial reason for it, but that it should exist and did exist among the paupers, the loafers, the tag rag and bobtail of the community and in a passionate and uncompromising form is not in our remote day realizable. It seemed natural enough to me then, and natural enough that Huck and his father and the worthless loafer should feel it and approve it, though now it seems absurd. 
It shows that a strange thing, the conscience, the unerring monitor, can be trained to approve any wild thing you want it to approve if you begin its education early and stick to it. So what are the objectives of the smaller movement within realism, naturalism? Well, presentation is very objective and detached. The subject matter is usually quite raw and unpleasant experiences which reduce people to degrading circumstances in order to survive. Its setting is very commonplace and you see your characters as unheroic. Now, the novelist discovers qualities in lower class characters and they usually associate them with heroes. So there's a suggestion that life on its lowest levels is certainly more complicated. Now, what are some of the themes in naturalism? Well, man is fundamentally an animal. You do not have free will. You're governed by what is determined, that sense of fate. Now, there's external and internal forces. There's environment or heredity that controls your behavior. Now, characters have compensating humanistic values, which affirm they are alive. They, they know they are alive. But that struggle for life becomes heroic, and it's going to affirm that human dignity. Usually when people read naturalism, there's this pessimistic view of human capabilities, that life is somehow a trap. You can't get away from it. So what is the ultimate problem in realism? Whose reality is being portrayed? Usually when you're looking at your authors, those are those who are in power, and they're usually male, white, and privileged. Now whose reality is being marginalized and ignored? Well, those without power, women, people of color, and people of lower economic means. Well, that's the end of our introduction to realism. Thank you so much for stopping by. As always, I'd appreciate it if you would subscribe to the channel. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to learn more about realism or the naturalist movement.